Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve. When you consider your life, when you look at yourself, what do you see? Are you discouraged, disappointed? Learn to gain a new perspective on life in a message today called, Do You See What God Sees? was 1962 and a new Christmas song was born. It was an interesting song, and in the song it asked three questions. The first question, do you see what I see? The second question, do you hear what I hear? And the third question, do you know what I know? The song ends up with a stanza that goes this way said the king to the people everywhere, listen to what I say. Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Do you know what I know? God is saying to you and to me, listen to what I say. We're in a series that we started last week called Perspective, Understanding God and Man. And last week we looked at God at the nature of God, and God is a good God, a loving God, the only God, the God who is holy, holy, holy. I challenged you to memorize Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. I, I know I talked to one lady. She said, I'm working on it. You know, as you get older, memorization gets harder. Has anybody noticed that, how, how that works? So you who are younger, uh, I encourage you to memorize Scripture because when your mind is, is uh, good and fresh, things can stick uh, real well. As you get older, your mind is like a Post-it note that's been stuck on a bunch of times and it just doesn't, things don't stick like they used to. But it, Exodus 34, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who, the rest of it, who knows? Because I just forgot. Uh, <laughs> who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity on the Father to the children and the grandchildren, to the third and fourth generation. That is God. He is good. He is holy. He is the one and only. And so we talked about that last week, the nature of God, and that is so critical that we have the right picture of God hanging in our minds. But today we want to talk about the nature of man and who man is. Now, in this series, I make this contention. I think that we have lost perspective of both God and man. And we as a people have a warped perception of God, and we have a very inflated opinion and perception of man. And God has a passage in His Word, really all throughout His Word, we find out the true nature and character of man. But Romans chapter 3 really pinpoints what God sees, what God hears, what God knows. As we read this passage of Scripture and unearth this passage of Scripture and unpack it, some of you aren't going to like what is said here. Some of you are going to argue, as I'm preaching, you're going to argue in your mind, no, that's not true, no, I don't like that. Uh, but listen to what God says. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. And he quotes from different passages of the Old Testament. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. 
With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Man was walking through the park in Scotland on a beautiful summer day. He had, he was a Christian, and he had in his pocket a New Testament. And he was walking through the park, and there were some, uh, some college-age students that were just kind of goofing around, having fun, enjoying the beautiful day. And they asked this man, they said, hey, will you take a picture of us? And he said to them, I already have your picture. They said, what? He said, yeah, I already have your picture. I have it here in my pocket. They said, what are you talking about? And he pulled out his New Testament, and he turned to Romans chapter 3, and he read that passage of Scripture that I just read, and he said, that's your picture. That's who you are outside of Jesus Christ. Hey, do you really understand the true picture of man? You know, the Bible says that really there are only two men who have ever lived. There is Adam, the first man, and there is Jesus Christ, the second man. Sometimes he's called the second Adam. The Bible says that when we're born into this world, we're born in Adam because Adam and Eve didn't conceive any children until after they sinned. And when Adam and Eve sinned, then they had children and they produced sinners. And that's why David said in Psalm 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Every baby that is born is born with a sin nature, born in Adam. You have to be born again to be in Christ. You have to receive Christ as Savior and Lord in order to be in Christ. Now, the Bible says in Adam... But that's where we're all born. That's where we're all on the broad road that leads to destruction. In Adam, all die, but in Christ are all made alive. And so Paul, kind of like a, a lawyer in a courtroom, he is bringing the case against all humanity. Uh, humanity sits in the defense, and Paul is a prosecuting attorney, and he is laying out the indictment from the Lord against man. Uh, and he's talking about all those who are in Adam, all those who are natural, as the Scripture says, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. And so I want you to see with me four discoveries as we look through this passage together. Discovery number one, there is no one who is righteous. Look at verse 11 again, or verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. And incidentally, verse 10, 11, and 12, it all comes from Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, and Psalm 53, verses 1 through 3. Those passages are identical. And in the New American Standard, all those Old Testament verses in the New Testament, they always show up as all caps to let you know this is a quotation from the Old Testament. And the Lord says, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. No one is holy, no one is just, no one is innocent before God. We're all guilty, guilty, guilty. Now, sometimes when you think of all the billions of people who have been born into this world since the time of Adam and Eve, you say, really, there's none righteous, not even one? Well, what about Mother Teresa? I mean, she, she seemed like she was righteous. Nope. Not even one, not even Mother Teresa. What about the Pope? Not even the Pope. Well, what about Billy Graham? Not even Billy Graham. I said, what about Nicodemus, the one that came to Jesus by night? Yeah, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He wasn't righteous. There is none righteous, not even one. And then he begins to unpack that sum. He says that there is no one who understands God 
who understands righteousness, who understands sinfulness. Verse 11, there is none who understands. Who understands what? Who understands about God? Who understands what righteousness really is? Who understands what sinfulness really is? See, most people in our world today, they think they're pretty good. Well, I'm, I'm not. You know, nobody, I've never heard anyone say, well, I'm perfect. Nobody says he or she is perfect, but they think they're pretty good. And the reason they think they're pretty good is because they like to line up against someone who's not so good. And they think, well, you know, I'm better than my neighbor across the street. I'm better than so-and-so. I'm better than this person, that person. You know, I read about Hitler. I'm a lot better than Hitler. And so we, we like to compare with the wrong person. Maybe you heard the story about the two brothers lived in a small town. They were vicious, evil, wicked, deceitful, cheating brothers. They cheated in business. They cheated on their wives. They drank all the time. They were just horrible, and everybody in town knew that, the Jones brothers. Well, one of them died. And so the other brother who uh, was still alive, he came to the preacher in town and said, I, I need you to do my brother's funeral. And he said, here's the deal. I will pay you $5,000 if you do his funeral, but here's the caveat. You have to say in his funeral that my brother was a saint. The preacher's like, mm. he knew the brother. He knew these guys, and he was like, uh. He thought for a minute, he goes, okay, I'll do it. And so the day of the funeral came, and, you know, they were doing all the open, you know, things that they do and reading the Scripture and praying, and then the preacher got up, and he began to talk about this dead man, Mr. Jones. And he said, here lies Mr. Jones. He was an evil, vicious, vile, abominable, grotesque, horrible, awful sinner. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> we compare to the wrong thing. How do you do compared to the Lord Jesus Christ? See, he's the standard. When we compare to uh, the Hitlers of this world or some terrible, horrible, awful, overt sinner, we say, well, we match up pretty good, but they're not the standard. Jesus is the standard. And Jesus said, you, you shall be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, and that leaves us all out, and we don't understand. We think that God grades on the curve. We think that when we die, we're going to stand before God and He's going to put all our good works on one side and all our bad works on the other side of his great scale that he has there. If our good works outweigh our bad works, that's what we're hoping for. And then we get to go to heaven because that's the way it works. We are better. Uh, we had more good than bad. But it doesn't work that, like that at all. See, it works kind of like this. Suppose you had a five-gallon container of pure water. And then you mixed into the five-gallon container of pure water a cup of raw sewage, and you poured that in there. And you said, well, this is pretty good. This is five gallons, only one cup of sewage. It's five gallons of pure water. Who wants to drink that? Nobody. It's totally contaminated. Because once you add the sewage, the whole is ruined. That is man. And there is none, the Scripture says, no one who understands that. And then it says that there is none, verse 11, who seeks for God. None righteous, no one understands, no one seeks for God, for the true God. You know where that's so beautifully pictured? In Genesis chapter 3, the very first sin with Adam and Eve. So they eat of the fruit... Their eyes are opened, and now they know they're naked, and they sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness, and they're feeling pretty good about their new man-made religion, that they go their own way, and they can sew fig leaves, and they can uh, make it their own way until God comes down in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife, what did they do? They didn't seek God. They beat it to the bushes. They're hiding in the bushes, and God comes seeking man, Adam. Adam, where are you? Well, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? God was seeking man. Man doesn't seek God. 
The scripture says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He is the seeker. You know, we talk about sometimes we need to be seeker sensitive. Let me tell you, no one in and of himself on his own will seek God. Now, they may seek the things of God. They may say, well, you know, I want uh, the blessings of God. I want the things that come from God's hand. But they don't want God himself. And churches are filled with people who are looking for God to give them health and wealth and wisdom and all these things from God, but they don't necessarily want to have a relationship with God. They just want the the stuff from God. It's kind of like having a rich uncle, and you want to get close to your uncle. Why? So that you can get from him. You don't really care about him that much. You just want his stuff. And the Lord says, hey, there are people that do that. They want my stuff, but nobody naturally wants me. There's none who seeks after God. Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. When you find someone who is seeking after God, just know this, God has done a work in that person's heart to draw them to that point because by themselves, they're never going to come. So there is no one who understands God, no one who seeks God, and no one who wants to follow God, follow the true God. All have turned aside, it says. All have turned aside. They, they want to go their own way. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have what? We've gone astray. Each one has gone to his own way. That was the sin of Eve. If you eat this fruit, Eve, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, and you won't need to depend upon God, and you can go your own way, and you can be your own cheap little tin God. And she said, yeah, that's what I want, because I want to be captain of my own ship. I want to be master of my own destiny. And that describes man. He's not righteous. Why? Because he's going in the wrong way. You know, the, the Israelites in the book of Ezekiel, would say to the Lord, the way of the Lord is not right. And God said, is it my way that's not right? No, it's your way that is not right. And like sheep, we've wandered away and we go our own way. And that covers every one of us. All have turned aside. And then it says, together they have become useless in the New American Standard. Unprofitable is one translation. I like the God... God's Word translation, it says this, everyone has turned away. Together they have become rotten to the core. No one does anything good and not even, uh, not even one person. Rotten to the core. You know, that word for useless is a word that speaks of milk that's gone bad, meat that has become rancid. And so do you see what God sees? God looks and He sees and he smells, and we are like sour milk to him. We, we're useless. What do you do with sour milk? You throw it out. Remember Jesus said, uh, if salt loses its savor, it is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. It says in Luke's gospel that salt lo- that loses its saltiness is good for nothing. It's not good for the ground or for the manure pile. What do you do? You just throw it away. And that's what the Lord is saying as he looks at man. Good for nothing. Now, that is the big picture of the indictment. There is none righteous, not even one. And so the question comes in the courtroom, well, wait a minute. Give us some specifics. And so the the Apostle Paul goes into specifics. And he's going to talk now about what comes out of our mouths. You need some evidence in the courtroom? I can't just say that a man is, uh, there's none righteous, not even one. Well, let's give you some specifics. See, secondly, there is no one who speaks righteously. There's no one righteous, and it shows up in the way that they speak. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. 
Now, there are lots of passages in the Old Testament that talk about a man's mouth, a woman's mouth, a boy's mouth, a girl's mouth, that the human mouth and how we speak lies and we speak deceit. The Bible says that the lips of an adulteress drips honey, but smoother uh, than oil is her speech, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, and there is the poison of asps in her mouth. When you think about a man's speech and what you hear, see, the Lord says, do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? You want to have evidence? Just listen to what comes out of people's mouths. Our speech as people in Adam is atrocious. It's atrocious. That word atrocious means horrifyingly wicked. Have you found out how difficult it is to watch a movie these days because of the, the language that is used in movies? Athletics have become just pools of vulgarities. I mean, you can't watch a, a, a game without seeing the coach. You can see his mouth and what he's saying and the players and what they're saying. And it's spilled over into the college ranks, into the high school ranks, and coaches who just have X-rated mouths. And you're like, why are you doing that? I love John Wooden, the coach of the UCLA Bruins from yesteryear. He's in heaven now. But John Wooden never used profanity. And he wouldn't allow that on his, on his team. If you, used a, if you said a cuss word, you were out for the day. Because he said, that's a rule. We're not going to do that. And so his players said about John Wooden, they said, you know, he never cussed, but if he got mad, you'd hear him say, goodness gracious sakes alive. John Wooden was from the Midwest. One of his players said, whenever he said, goodness gracious sakes alive, that was a Midwest cussing from John Wooden. That was the worst thing that came out of his mouth. Mouth. But today we have uh, just all kinds of terrible things that pour out of the mouth and the lying. See, it talks about uh, with their tongues they keep deceiving and the poison of asps is under their lips. People lie, as the old expression goes, they lie like a dog. I mean, just for some people, it's just second nature. They just lie, lie, lie. Listen. You're never more like the devil than when you tell a lie. Why? Because he's a liar and the father of lies. And the Scripture is very clear how God feels about lying. Proverbs chapter 6, there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Number one on the list is a proud look. Number two is a false witness or a false witness who utters lies. Lying, uh, I'm sorry, lying lips. And then he goes on to say different things, and then he comes back to a false witness who utters lies. So the seven things God hates, two times he mentions lying. It's almost like God says, you know, I hate lying, and then he's going through a litany of other things, and he said, have I told you how much I hate lying? He hates lying lips. He hates a false witness who utters lies. Sunday school teacher was teaching her third grade class. She asked the question, boys and girls, what is lying? And one little boy raised his hand, said, teacher, lying is a great sin and a very present help in trouble. And that's kind of how we think about lying. Why do we lie? Because we think, well, that's going to get me out of hot water. That's going to help uh, me navigate this situation. If I told the truth, I'd get in trouble, so I'm going to lie about it. God hears. God knows everything that comes out of your mouth, everything that comes out of my mouth. And the evidence of, of our depravity is found in our mouth, and the mouth reveals the heart. So our speech is atrocious, and it reveals our heart. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. See, it says here in verse 13, their throat is an open grave. Very descriptive, an open grave. 
Now, when the, a, a grave would be sealed in Bible times because you didn't want that to be open. Why? Because they didn't, the Jews didn't embalm people. They would put spices on them and put spices and prepare the body that way, but there was no embalming. So that person, as he began to rot and decay, would stink. Do you remember in John chapter 11 when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and he told Martha, roll away the stone, and she said, Lord, it's been four days. I don't want to roll away the stone. Lord, he stinks. There's a stench there if we roll away the stone and have an open grave. That's what God says about a man's mouth. Why, is, why does he have cursing and bitterness come out of his mouth? Because the throat is an open grave and the rottenness is coming from the heart. And the foul exhalations come out of the heart. And that's what Jeremiah said, Jeremiah chapter 17. He said, the heart of man is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can know it? So if you want to know why you say the things that you say, the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. And so when the bitterness comes out, when the cursings come out, when the lies come out, it just shows that all that is in your heart. So that's the first piece of evidence is words. There is no one who speaks righteously. And then he goes on to ways. Look at the words, look at the ways. There is no one who acts righteously. It says in verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Their feet are swift to shed blood. We are so quick to murder one another. So quick to murder one another. You said, well, there's, we are not like that. Maybe they were like that way back then when Paul wrote this in the first century. We're not like that now. You know how many abortions there were last year? 893,000 abortions in the United States of America. That's about 100 abortions every hour. We're quick to murder one another. And outside of abortion, just when you talk about uh, domestic violence or uh, just fights on the street, that kind of thing, there's a crime clock statistic we have that we're going to put up on the screen. This was from 2016. A violent, a, a violent crime occurs every 25.3 seconds. One murder every 30.6 minutes one rape every four minutes, one robbery every 1.6 minutes, one aggravated assault every 39.4 seconds. That's man in Adam. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Of the six things that the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, feet that run rapidly to evil. Those are included in there. God hates that. And we are a murderous people. You know who has the, the worst murder rate in the United States? Chicago. The toughest gun laws, the highest murder rate. You know, if you take away people's guns, they just kill people with knives. Take away their knives, they're going to beat them with a stick. Take away the stick, they'll run them over with their car. We just live in a society, and uh, it's in the heart of man to murder one another. The very first sin recorded after the fall of Adam and Eve, Cain killing Abel. God wanted a blood sacrifice. Cain says, I'm not coming with a blood sacrifice. I'm not going to slit the throat of a lamb, but I tell you what I will do. I'll slit the throat of my brother Abel, and that's what he did. The very first sin that is recorded after the fall of man is murder. We're quick to murder others, and we leave behind a wake of destruction and misery. Now, this is tough stuff. Lots of people don't want to hear this about mankind, but this is what God sees. This is what God hears. This is what God knows. As Jack Nicholson said in A Few Good Men, to paraphrase, can you handle the truth? Because this is the truth about 
man. We leave behind a wake of destruction and misery. Verse 16, destruction and misery are in their paths. Destruction means to shatter, and we shatter stuff. You know, if God had allowed Adam and Eve to remain in the garden of Eden, he didn't. He drove them out. Why? Because there was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, and God didn't want them to eat of the tree of life and live forever in a fallen state. But if if God put uh, sinful man, inadam men, in a perfect place, we would leave destruction and misery there in no time. Why? Because that's what we do. That is man. He leaves behind a wake of misery. And then it says, the path of peace have they not known. We can't live in peace. All those in Adam, we don't live in peace. I think it's interesting, you know, you have in Islam, we all know that Islam hates the Jews and they hate the Christians. They want to, uh, the, the radical jihadists, they want to kill the Jews and kill the Christians. And then if, if the whole world is Islamic and you have the black flag uh, on every capital in the world, well, then everything would be at peace, right? Wrong. Because you have factions inside of uh, Islam. And so this group hates that group, and that group hates this group, and this other group hates the first group. And the Sunnis don't like the Shias, and the Shias don't like the Sunnis. And so if there are no Christians or Jews to kill, they'll kill each other. There is no peace. We don't know the way of peace. I think it's very interesting when Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He made his grand entrance into Jerusalem, and they were laying down palm branches, and they were saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. They were declaring him to be the Messiah and associating him with the Messiah. And Jesus came into the city and he wept over it and he said, if you had known this day the things that make for peace. The Prince of Peace had come to them, but they didn't know the things that make for peace. And in just five days, they would take the Prince of Peace and nail him to a tree. That's man. That's what you see in man. Can't live in peace. So our words are the evidence that our heart is rotten. Our actions, evidence that our heart is rotten. And you say, what is causing all the rottenness? Why the rotten heart? Why the rotten words? Why the rotten actions? Why the murder? Why the misery? Why the destruction? Because it says in verse 18, There is no fear of God before their eyes. We refuse to fear God. That kind of sums up why we're in the mess that we're in. Because in Proverbs, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can't have knowledge and you can't have wisdom unless you have the fear of the Lord because that's the starting point. That's first base in wisdom and knowledge. And it says in Romans chapter 1 that the people didn't want to acknowledge God anymore. They didn't want to give him thanks. They didn't want to give him honor. They said, forget you, God. We're going to go our own way. If you don't fear God, then you won't follow God, and you're just going to go down the cliff that leads to hell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning Now, there are two aspects to the fear of the Lord. There's the positive aspect of we just stand in awe of God and we say, wow, God, you're God. You spoke the worlds into existence, and I just stand in awe of you. We sing that song sometimes. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praises due, I stand in awe of you. That is the positive aspect of fearing God. But then there's a negative aspect of fearing God. And the negative aspect of fearing God is this. Our God is a consuming fire. And you have this uh, tremendous reverence and awe of God, but then you also have a healthy respect of who God is. 
And when you have a healthy respect of who God is, that keeps you away from evil because you say, man, I can't do X, Y, and Z. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. And I'm going to have to answer to God one day. And so, man, I'm going to keep the, the Scripture says the fear of the Lord. By the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. But in our world, just as in Paul's world, there was no fear of God. And when there's no fear of God, it's Katie bar the door. There's none who acts righteously. There's none who speaks righteously. And that's the evidence. And then he gives, fourthly, the verdict. There is no one who does not stand hopelessly condemned before God. No one, not even one. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. That word accountable means to be condemned, to be guilty before God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God presents his case about the sinfulness of man, and when the defense rises to give a rebuttal, there is nothing. There's nothing to say. Because everything God said is true, and it nails man to the wall, and every mouth is closed, it's stopped, it's shut up, there's nothing to say. You know what happens to all those who are in Adam? See, the Scripture says, in Adam all die. The wages of sin is death. When you die outside of Christ, then you have you go to a place called Hades, which is like the county jail. You know, that's what happens in any kind of uh, criminal situation. The, the policemen come and they arrest the perpetrator. They put them in county jail. You're in county jail until you have your day in court with the judge. And the day in court with the judge of all the earth is called the great white throne judgment. And at the great white throne judgment, God reads off the record of the charges against every person who is in Adam. Every single person will stand alone at the great white throne. It's such a frightening experience. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 20. And, and John says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and there was no place found for them. There was nowhere to run. There was nowhere to hide. You didn't want to be there at the great white throne, but they stand there and books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And every man was judged according to the deeds which were written in the book. God has books with all your deeds in them. Everyone in Adam, all their deeds, they're written. All the sins, everything that comes out of your mouth. Jesus said, uh, every idle word a man shall speak, he'll, he'll give an account for it on the day of judgment. For, but, for by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. And so every idle word, it's going to be in there. Everything that you thought, everything that you did, it's in there. It's in the book. And he reads it all off. And you're standing there, and God just shows you the weight of your sin. And you who think, well, I'm good enough to get to heaven, you're going to see on that day how sinful and evil and wicked you are. And when it comes time for rebuttal, you're not going to have anything to say. And you're just going to stand there with your mouth closed. And the Lord will give the sentence, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The book of life is open at the judgment seat of Christ, or at the great white throne judgment. Why is that? You know, nobody, his name's in the book of life that stands at the great white throne. The book of life is open at the great white throne to show every single person that there was a spot in my book for you. Jesus hung naked on a cross for you, and you could have been saved, but you said no to the sinless Son of God and to the cross of Jesus Christ. Hey, Unless God intervenes, mankind is justly doomed. That's the point of what he is saying. You can't do the law 
and, and think that you can be made right with God. The law, what is the law? The law is a mirror. The law just shows you how sinful you are. The law is a thermometer. It just shows you how sick you are. Nobody gets better by sucking on the thermometer. Nobody cleans his face by rubbing it on the mirror. Those things are just tools. They don't help you to, to get better. They just show you how sick you are. And God is saying the world is sick with sin. And unless I intervene, every single human being is going to rightfully go to hell. And that is just and that is right from a holy God. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You would have to be a fool to say, nope, I'm just going to stay in Adam. I'm going to uh, just take my chances. I'm a pretty good person. You're lying to yourself. Your life is filled with raw sewage before a holy God. And if you die in Adam, you will spend eternity in hell. Listen, we talk about the gospel being good news, and it is good news. That's what that word means. Gospel means good news, good story. But the good news only makes sense when you understand the bad news. And the bad news is this. You're born in Adam, and in Adam all die. It's only in Christ are all made alive. And the invitation goes out to every single person. Whosoever believes in Jesus will be saved. Thanks for watching today. Listen, as we close out the broadcast, if you're not certain about your relationship with Jesus, now is the time to make certain. Just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead on the third day. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real